Now, tonight we have six stories about proof inspired by the odd corners of history, art, science, and adventure. And there will be a cocktail break in the middle, so you will have a chance to refresh, re refresh your glass. Uh, our speakers are both experts and enthusiastic amateurs, so please be generous with your applause. Thank you. Now, this is not a quiet event. We have a series of traditional callbacks, which uh, you may be familiar with. And also, if you find yourself feeling particularly witty, you can invent a new callback. But we'll start with some of the traditional ones. So regulars, please help me out. Yes. This is Galvani. Ooh. And for tonight. Proof. Okay, let me explain. This, uh, don't groan. Uh, this is the process of proofing yeast. When you proof yeast, you're testing the yeast to make sure that it's active. It's a, it's a, it's a trial of, of the ingredient. So tonight, to kick things off, I'm going to talk about this trying aspect. Proof, as we use it now, derives from probare in Latin, which means to test. Uh, if you prove something, you're, you're committing a test against it. So at its core, proof is about trials, testing, and verifying. In a modern sense, we often use proof as a synonym for evidence, which, uh, which still comes back to testing because you use proof to settle a debate or a test. So this concept of testing informs the wide usage of proof. Mathematical or legal proofs are using evidence to demonstrate a truth. In manufacturing, a proof is a trial impression or a test. And if you're running a proof of concept, this is a test that your ideas work. So similarly, rust proof means that a material can withstand the trial of rust, just like fool proof means that something can survive the trial of fools. <laughs> Tonight, we have some exceptionally wonderful and nerdy talks about math, law, physics, musical theory, uh, all kinds of proofs that are, that are tried and tested. And for tonight's invocation, I'm going to start with an examination of some delicious proofs. Let's start with alcoholic proof. As some of you may know, uh, ABV, or alcohol by volume, is the percentage of ethanol that is in a spirit. So in the US, Proof is twice the ABV. Why is that? It makes no sense if something is 20% alcohol by volume to say that it's 40% proof. So, spoilers. So turns out there's a test for that called the gunpowder proof. This all starts with taxes. In the 1500s in England, spirits with higher ABV were taxed more than watered down spirits with lower ABV. So there needs to be a test to ascertain if, our, if alcohol has been watered down. The simple way to determine that is, you, you take a pellet of gunpowder, you soak it in the alcohol, and then you apply fire. <laughs> if it fails to ignite, then that is proof that there is more water content in the spirits, and thus the alcohol by volume is below 57% ABV, and thus a low proof. If it goes kaboom, the ABV is higher than 57%, and it is subject to a higher tax rate. Alcohol that did ignite was considered 100% proof, as in 100% on fire. Lower proof is 100% not on fire. Now, it turns out there are more sophisticated ways to determine the content of ethanol in beverages than just lighting shit on fire. And in 1815, I know, best science. So... To regulate spirits, by 1815, the specific gravity test was introduced, which sets the more, uh, which, which can predict a more accurate volume of, of ethanol. So uh, don't try this at home. Don't try this here. And now, for tonight's invocation, I'd like to go into another edible topic of proofs. You have probably heard the incorrect phrase, the proof is in the pudding. This is a poorly understood adage, which means, well, different things according to who you ask. 
Some people use the proof is in the pudding to mean the evidence. It's right there. Some people use uh, the proof is in the pudding to mean the evidence is really hard to get to. So just take my word for it. Some people use like, I told you so. And uh, lastly, because figurative language is apparently hard for some people, I have actually met people who think that it means like you get a Cracker Jack prize in your pudding. <laughs> this is not the case. This is a bastardized term and it is all bullshit. The correct proverb dating all the way back to the 14th century in England is the proof of the pudding is in the eating, which has a very simple meaning, which I will explain. But before I explain the proverb, I'd like to point out that it is 600 years old, and in that time, the concept and execution of pudding has changed substantially. <laughs> now, currently, as Americans, we think of pudding as a sweet custardy dessert. In, uh, in England, it often means like a, a steamed dessert course or a, a, some other sweet dish. And before it meant a steamed, uh, before that, pudding meant a sweet or savory steamed dish. But this is a six to seven year, six to seven hundred year old proverb. So we're talking about medieval pudding, which is this. Pudding comes from Middle English podding or pudding, which is a meat filled animal stomach, which comes from Old French boudin, blood sausage. Now, I can tell <laughs> from some of the loving cries of sausage that some of you are hung up on the meat-filled animal sausage a bit. So, uh, you know, never ask how the sausage is made, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> For a medieval sausage, you take the parts from the sheep or pig that you cannot sell. This is called the pluck. That is the heart, the lungs, the liver, and any other mystery bits. You mince it, you mix in oats and suet, which is hard, raw fat, and then you stuff the mixture into the animal's stomach, tie off the ends, and boil it, which you may, uh, you may recognize today as haggis. haggis. So delicious. And in fact, you don't know if you'll, if you'll like something unless you try it, which brings us back to the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So this, this idea of proof, again, comes back to tests. Simply put, you need to experience something before passing judgment. So you cannot tell if it is good or bad without, you cannot determine this without experiencing it. So as a delightful aside, as I was reading about haggis, uh, I learned that traditional Scottish haggis is illegal in the U.S. and has been for, 45, uh, for about 45 years. Because Scottish haggis is about 15% sheep lung by volume, and it has been illegal to import this to the U.S. for health concerns, despite absolutely no proof of harm to human beings for consuming cooked sheep lung. So, sheep, sheep have lungs, definitely. What was that? But we don't eat them. It is illegal. You cannot get domestic, you may not get domestic or imported haggis for it is illegal to eat sheep lungs. So I encourage you to try new things. Maybe not haggis, because it is hard to get here. But again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So in shorthand, I'd like to thank all of you new audience members for coming out, for trying something new, for experience this, experiencing this to determine if you'd like it. So a little toast to proof, to alcoholic proof, to the proof of pudding being in the evening. And with that, I would like to welcome our speakers. Tonight, we have several amazing speakers. We have, uh, please welcome Beth Abdallah, Cor Courtney Brown, Martin Strauss, and I'd like to give you an exceptionally loud and warm welcome to our new speakers, Roger Antonson, Megan Berman, and Boris Levitt. And now to speak about the Green Briar Ghost, please welcome Beth Abdallah. <laughs> 